All right, we'll try that again. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to the Soil Health Seminar this morning. Uh, my name is Paige Frouchy, and I am the Iowa Ag Program Director with the Iowa Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Very excited to be the moderator for this distinguished panel today. Um, before we dive in, uh, just if you're not aware of who the Nature Conservancy is and why the heck we're here moderating this panel today, uh, the Nature Conservancy is a global non with the mission to protect the lands and waters upon which all life depends. So that means protecting rainforests and coral reefs, but also the soil and water in places like Iowa, where so much of our global food population is grown. So some of our work here in Iowa, and I think I'm going to take off my mask because it's hard to breathe and talk a lot at the same time. Um, so part of that work here in Iowa has been uh, helping to lead the 4R Plus initiative, which is focused on educating and um, doing outreach to farmers and crop advisors on 4R Plus practices, which includes nutrient management and conservation practices like cover crops, reduced tillage, um, and edge of field practices like bioreactors, buffer strips, and so on. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot about those types of practices today with our panel and their impact on soil health and the, uh, the positive um, impacts that it has on things like um, soil health, water quality, and all of that. So without further ado, I will ask our three panelists to introduce themselves, um, talk, just share your farm location, um, some information about any family members involved, uh, crops and livestock, just kind of a general overview of your operation, um, as well as conservation practices that you use uh, on your own land and then also maybe on any rented land that you, uh, that you farm as well. So Ralph, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Uh, I'm Ralph Lentz. I'm from Adair County. I'm about uh, 60 miles west and south of here. Uh, we farm in three different counties down there. I farm with my brother and nephew and uh, we've got rented ground about a thousand acres between us that we rent and then we own a bunch of ground down there uh, we do have a corn soybean operation with a lot of stock cows uh, my brother's a clubby calf raiser uh, my nephew raises red angus and sells red heifers and me i'm just a commercial guy i'm taking it easy <laughs> but uh, we're very interested in our conservation practices um, we do a lot of no-till, uh, strip-till, not strip-till, but we have buffers and uh, we do a lot of terracing and everything, waterways. We're very conscious, conscientious about the uh, water that runs off our farms and uh, our goal is to leave that land in a better place than when we found it. Hi everybody, Mark Heckman. Um, Heckman Farms is, is our farming operation. It's a family partnership. Um, we started in 1984, um, really first, second generation. My dad farmed, had an off-farm job, and we started with 60 acres, and right now we're um, operating about 1,500. Um, corn, beans, um, uh, we actually have uh, finishing buildings, some hogs that are on it, we use the manure, and then uh, cattle that uh, my son got me into in, I think, 2014. So if you go back and look at the prices, probably wasn't the best time to get in, but um, anyhow, it's one of those things that's really helped our operation. Um, let's see, looking at uh, uh, the, the operation, we really have been focused on doing more with less pretty much uh, all of our life, um, looking to try to figure out how we can, you know, less, uh, less passes across the field, etc. So to that end, we're 100% no-till. We use cover crops on, I think, 95, 98% of our ground this last year. And that wasn't always the case. It was a case that in 2014, uh, we started with 40 acres. We joined up with uh, the initiatives of Iowa Corn, National Corn with the Soil Health um, Partnership Program. And we wanted to get the facts and the data. And what we found was that it really did help and improve the soil health. It gave us resilience all the way through and uh, helped to nurture the soil. So our no-till uh, is also Manure, we put in strips and strip till. We plant right above it so we can actually stretch our manure farther and reduce our nitrogen and, and those nutrients. Um, so also on the farm, we've got uh, wetland, 
uh, CRP, buffer strips, and really just focused on um, if the ground is, is uh, not paying a return to us or making it so that it's beneficial, how can we benefit some other way and, and really benefit from the environment, provide some good, good habitat for nature. So thanks for having me. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Will Cannon. Uh, I farm over in Jasper County, uh, Prairie City, Newton is, is where our farms are at. Uh, we have a, actually have a couple of farms that uh, you can see the principal building from the from the field. So we're always kind of farming in the in the shadow of Des Moines and and realize who our customers are. Um, I'm basically first generation. I grew up on a, a very small part time farm and uh, started farming right out of high school. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, we've built it up over the last 20 years here. We're farming about a thousand acres for 2022. Uh, we've been using cover crops for 14 years now on 100% of our acres, and um, we've also been strip tilling our corn and no tilling soybeans, and we use uh, variable rate uh, technology, and we've gone to a lot of split timing application of, of our products as well. So being first generation and, and having to build the farm up, uh, it's always been about being very conscientious of, of the budget uh, and the environment, and so we, we try to be really, really timely and and uh, really efficient with what we use. Um, I started using cover crops because uh, I've, I've just always kind of had a passion for um, being a conservationist of the ground, and so we've worked really hard at that. So when I started with cover crops, it was just about e reducing erosion, uh, but over time I've learned more and, and uh, we're using it for a lot more reasons than just erosion control, which we'll get into as, as we talk about it today, I'm sure. Great, thanks all of you. So, uh, you know, some of you mentioned this word resilience in your introductions. In, in light of some of the uh, weather events that we've seen here in Iowa over the last couple of years, we've had the derecho, we've had a drought, um, there's just been lots of challenges. Can you talk a little bit about how some of your soil health practices that you've just described have helped your farms be more resilient to these types of weather events? Yeah, any one of you can start. All right, I do the short straw. Um, I think uh, on our farm, uh, what I've seen is a lot more consistency in our yields uh, over over the years. Um, on soybeans, I think uh, generally we're probably averaging two or three bushel an acre better than than the neighbors. That's just you know you have to filter through the coffee shop talk, right? But uh, but talking to some of the people, I do kind of trust their numbers. Um, you know, we've got some years where I think we're beating them by five or six, probably at least. Um, and we've got a couple of years where we're basically about even. But um, the cover crop in front of soybeans just works. Um, I, it's meeting our conservation goals. It's meeting a lot of soil health goals. And I think it's it's got a big economic return because we're seeing better yields from the beans. We're seeing better weed control. Um, on the corn, I think it's it's a little bit more tricky. but. But again, using cover crops every year, I'm seeing a difference in the, in the color and texture of our soil. And I can look at yield maps of some of our worst parts in the, in the field. And if you flip through the maps, I can, I can show you those bad spots are shrinking. Um, and, and the yields are coming up in those areas. So, uh, and I don't feel like we're, we're losing any yield in the good areas. So I, I think we're getting more resiliency because we're, every year is more consistent. Um, and then in the beans, we're definitely seeing a yield benefit. Yeah, to add to that, um, I think one of the things that, it, the way we look at it is that that soil is a, a sponge. And what can you do to help that sponge? Basically, increase porosity, increase your organic matter. But putting the organic matter out there, it makes it so that that water can really move those nutrients around. The nutrients are there, the microbes are working, the next thing is is making sure that you conserve the water and get it so that that water holding capacity and it, and it works for you when the times that it's, it's needed. A lot of people mulch their gardens. So us putting cover crops out there and, and really getting it so that we've got that ground covered as long as possible, getting the organic matter in the soil so that it's got the tubulars to get to, from where it is to where it needs to be. Um, all that around makes it so that 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 soil is, is an active, working, living sponge that can get the nutrients into the plants. 
The last thing I'll say is from a spraying standpoint, there's many times that we'll get an inch of rain where prior to cover crops, that water would run off or those nutrients would actually leave and uh, you're, you're out of the field for a while. It's actually, cover crops actually help us to, to really make it so that, that even though the water's there, after a rain, we can enter the field in a more timely fashion to make sure that we get the rain uh, and, that, and that activity. So um, I think that's about. <laughs> They've done a good job explaining it. And uh, I guess all I'd add to it is that uh, organic matter matters a lot on soil conditions, soil health. It, ha it creates the water holding capacity in these years that we are short on rainfall. Um, I've seen a big difference in our own operation. Last four or five years, we've been on the light side of the rain, and yet our yields are increasing. And I think it's just because we got more water in the soil, and it's more available for the crops. And it's due to organic matter, cover crops, just the way that we farm generally. Also, we've went to a split application on nitrogen and, and all our fertilizers. We're doing more with less. We're putting more, less fertilizer out there and raising more crops. So just whatever works for you, uh, keep trying. But uh, I, I think we can raise more with less now just because of our practices. Great. Thanks to all of you. Um, so, you know, some of your answers reference these yield increases or at least consistency across yields from using soil health practices. Have you noticed any other types of benefits from these practices, like weed control, um, reduction in nutrient use? Some of you mentioned that already, but um, any other benefits that, that you see that maybe aren't quite as obvious? Well, with cover crops, you can get by with less chemical because if you let that uh, rye or whatever you're using stand there a while, when you go to kill it, it will hold the weeds back and uh, maybe you can get by with no pass a second time or very little uh, chemical in that second pass. So it, it does make a big difference. And you will find using cover crops that your ground will stay cleaner. Uh, you know, uh, I guess organic matter is another thing. It kind of holds the weed pressure back. So the more cover that you have on your crops, your dirt, uh, it just stays cleaner all the way around. Yeah, the other item that, that comes around, carbon's a big topic that is, uh, is also out here. Our farm in the Soil Health Partnership actually had uh, data points that it, it participated in their study for six years, and um, soybean promotion or the Iowa Soybean Association is picking that up. But uh, through that study, we actually saw our organic matter increase, and we saw our uh, carbon matter increase. But the greatest improvement was the soil aggregate, which really <laughs> talked about how how stable that, that, that soil is and the microbial activity. You need all of that to increase the carbon. And it also showed those increases as, as you, we've gone through and participated in these seven years. So Muscatine County, if you look at it, it's got a history of a lot of sand. And we have to do everything we can to conserve and create organic matter. So that's what we're, we really focus on. How can we get more organic matter out there? Um, that's one of the ways. Ralph talked about weed suppression, so I won't, won't cover that, but if you've got rye out there, it's displacing the area and uh, creating issues for any of those weeds to germinate, so. Yeah, I think they, they cover most of the targets. I, I guess one of the, the, the fun things I like, again, conservation's a passion of mine, is is um, I really like it when, when we do get a rain, when we used to get rains. <laughs> the, the last couple of years have been really dry in our area, but <clears throat> uh, sometimes I like to go out and just drive around and look at the fields while it's raining. And one of my favorite things is when I can uh, drive by a field uh, during a heavy rain and see that the water is still clear in the waterway uh, as it's exiting the, the farm. And that there's just a lot of satisfaction in that. Um, and, and secondly, you know, some of our other conservation practices, such as waterways and buffer strips and so forth, we're just seeing a lot less soil moving within the field. Um, it's probably been five or six years since we've gone back and maintained any of our, our grass waterways. Whereas before, even with no-till, we were probably doing it every two or three years. So 
Um, there's lots of little things like that that can that can add up to the edge of field practices and some of the things that can happen. But um, that's just a good feeling when you can drive around and, and see something like that. There's a lot of satisfaction in it. Wow, thank you guys. I think between the three of you, you really covered kind of the gamut there. Um, so I guess one question building off of the weed suppression, have you noticed, do you have challenges in your areas with herbicide resistant weeds and have the cover crops been helpful in that, that that you've noticed? I know I've heard that from other farmers. Yeah, I think um, on the soybean side, we're seeing a really big difference. Um, we, we've tried to not only use cover crops to help with weeds, but we've also tried to use multiple modes of action with our chemistry. Um, but I, I would say on our farm, it seemed like we saw more effectiveness out of, out of some of the herbicides that are, are starting to show resistance. We were probably getting two to three more years of effectiveness out of those products than, than other neighbors that were having to move on to newer technologies. Um, and, and like Ralph said, we've, we've experimented, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of years uh, where we've actually allowed the cover crop to grow with the soybeans. Um, and in both years, it was, it was amazing to be able to go out and make one pass of herbicide, uh, usually around about Memorial Day is when we did it. Um, and so to be able to go out and terminate the cover crop, be able to kill any weeds that were growing, and then the field just stayed clean the rest of the year. So, um, uh, and, and on the better ground, the yields were very good. On the poorer ground, uh, yields probably dragged a little bit, but when you start adding in the savings on herbicide, um, especially the way they're going to be here in 2022, I think some of those practices can pay off. So, um, you know, on our farm, we're looking at some ways that we're going to probably adjust chemical applications, timings, and, and probably push the, the envelope a little bit on cover crops to help with, with some of the resistance. I think one of the things that Will touched on kind of jogged my memory is on the poor ground, um, I think we've seen the better benefits from cover crops. And that's also because the weeds seem to generate, if you have uh, dry conditions, et cetera, herbicides, they don't seem to work as well on lighter soil, sand, et cetera. So we lose that and we have a, have a quicker, uh, uh, our canopy's not as quicker. We've got a lot more weed pressure. So that on your poorer ground, if you're really, you know, just trying to dip your toe in the water to say, how do I, how do, I do this or where should I do this? I think if you focused on your poorer ground, you're going to get the biggest, biggest bang for your buck, and poorer ground meaning, you know, something that's producing either more weeds, less yield, etc. Um, that's what we've found on ours. It really helps in those areas. They've pretty well covered the uh, chemical weed control part of it, but the, the big benefit is the amount of soil that you save. I mean, we've got some slopes down there, and. Uh, I tell you, once you put this out there, you don't lose very much dirt with the cover crops. Um, you know, that's a big benefit to anybody if you can keep your soil in place. Thanks, guys. Um, another thing that you've all kind of touched on a little bit is this concept of nutrient management and how soil health has helped. Um, maybe you, you'd be able to cut back a little bit on nitrogen, but can you talk a little bit, wh whichever one of you, or all of you, um, about you know any changes that you've made? You know, we talked about the four R's of nutrient management: right rate, right time, right source, right um, location. Ha have you made any adjustments to your nutrient management to accommodate for some of these soil health practices, or, or how does that uh, aspect of your operation look? I'll start this off, but. Uh on the P and K side, we're doing a lot of variable rates anymore. You do your soil testing, you know, and you see where your areas are that are really producing from your yield maps. You hit that harder, and the and the areas that aren't producing, we don't hit that as hard. And, and uh, you would think there'd be a big cost savings there, but it kind of averages all out. It's it's about the same amount of dollars in the in the end, but by fertilizing harder on the good ground, you're getting better yields. Uh, the nitrogen thing, uh, I love split applications. I don't like to see all that anhydrous go on in one shot and forget about it. Uh, I feel that you lose way too much of that. Uh, by split applications, it really helps the corn plant uh, as through the whole growing season, and I think that's a real benefit of, of split applications. Yeah, really, the, 
Strip till combined with cover crops is a great combination for corn. What you do is, you know, if you come in early in the spring, you can actually cut back your nutrients or with those same nutrients that you're using, you're producing more because you're putting, you're feeding that plant right below it. The cover crops are out there working. The microbes are actually working for you. The earthworms, everything is being encouraged by the growth because you're not opening up the soil and, and really exposing those microbes to things that are their enemies. And by doing that, you're letting the soil work for you longer. It keeps it covered. And by the strip till, you've got everything that if you're really, you know, we shoot target high yield and we're really focused on, on all of that. Our hope is that we can get down to 0 0.7, 0 0.8 pounds of nitrogen per, unit, per bushel of corn. And at the end of the year, if we can get to those kind of numbers, we feel pretty successful about, um, or pretty happy about that. And we've had a, a successful year for that, especially in times when prices are, are the way they are. Um, and then P and K, um, we're letting the microbes do their job. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the, the, thing, the, the thing about it is, is you gotta think about it as a system, right? So no, no one tool is gonna get you there on reducing your inputs. <clears throat> like these guys said though, it's, it's all these things working in concert with one another. So for us, <clears throat> it's the cover crops, holding the soil, holding the nutrients, making nutrients more available um, you know, there's some good research data out there showing where a cereal rye crop is probably picking up about 30, 35 pounds of nitrogen that would otherwise leave the field that can be available then to your, to your corn crop. Um, and, and I've also seen some private research data showing where uh, phosphorus is more readily available to your cash crop, uh, that the, the rye actually turns it into an organic form that's more available. So, on our farm, the, using the cover crops for those reasons um, and the strip till uh, has made a huge difference because like Mark said, we can place our fertility where we do. So we're using typically a third or maybe half of what we used to for phosphorus. Uh, potassium, we haven't backed off a whole lot of uh, uh, for, because we think we can kind of push yield there because potassium is such a hard nutrient to get up into the crop that we still like placing that in the band underneath the crop. But, We've seen huge reductions in the phosphorus we use. And then the split application of the nitrogen. So we're banding some of the nitrogen right where the corn's gonna be, uh, making sure it's there. We're, we're saving nitrogen in the field with the rye. And then coming back with the split application, we can adjust and adapt to what the season is giving us. So we've had years where we need to put on another 50, 7,500 units of nitrogen. Last year, I never side dressed. So, We've got corn that we raised uh, probably on average about 0 0.65, 0 0.7 units of nitrogen per bushel. Uh, but, I mean, you know how your fields are. There's parts of the field where we did it on probably 0.5. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and so then you think about it, well, now I've got nitrogen still sitting in the barrel that I bought two years ago that I didn't use last year that I'm going to get to use this next year. So. I've got nitrogen in the barrel for a quarter of what the price is now. So um, it, when you start looking at the system and you put that system together, all these things can, can really amplify uh, your savings. Yeah, and that system, uh, one other comment. It's not just about nitrogen. Focus on the micros, um, the micronutrients. And, and if you focus on that, then you really can cut back on some of those majors. Um, it's all about balance, like Will talked and um, lime, pH. Make sure that you've got, you, you know, your buffer pH where it needs to be in order to support those crops and, and the nutrients, um, et cetera, because it is about the balance. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I, I love that um, call out of how it's a systems approach and really all of these different tools are working together and the cover crops are helping keep provide food for the microbes so they can be cycling nutrients that you can then have available for your crop the following year. So that's really great to hear. Um, and so we have a lot of other topics to, to dive into today, but I just wanted to, so for someone just starting out, like this can, can kind of come across as overwhelming. Like there's so many things to think about when you guys were first starting out with some of these practices, like what did you, did you have other farmers or mentors that were helping you or what were kind of some of the ways that you were able to learn about these practices and uh, try them out on your own farms and Ralph why don't you start 
trial and error. <laughs> it's how we started out. Uh, you know, when we went into all this, there wasn't a lot of experience out there, so everybody was try, trying things, different things, and then uh, you could go to some meetings, you know, later on and see what worked for people, what didn't work for people. Uh, when it comes to cover crops, you know, it takes more than one, two, three years to make that work. I mean, you got to play with that thing for quite a while to make, to see the good returns out of it, because, I mean, organic matter is a slow thing to build in the soils, uh, you know, your, your weed problems and things like that disappear over time, it doesn't happen overnight, uh, you know, the, you just go and get information from other people because uh, you trial, you know, you make some mistakes, and you just move on. But uh, persistence will win the battle. I, I blame about three people. I think one is Ben Gleason with uh, Iowa Corn. Uh, also blame my son, and I think it's a hereditary situation. Um, simply, we get, we're creatures of habits, and we, we sit out here uh, thinking that we want to do everything the right way. We want to do everything and we think that we've got the best practices in place. But it takes somebody like those individuals that I mentioned to push us past that. We started with 40 acres. Um, Soil Health Partnership came about and it was pushed by Iowa Corn and Ben Gleason to, to really get involved and try to figure out, let's get the data behind it before we jumped into it. And And really that's that's what drove us to it, and it was a hard decision because we had deep tillage. We've got all those tools. Um, the, the issue is, and the really great thing is, this year prices are up for all of that used equipment. So we're cleaning out the shed. We're trying to figure out how we can, can move that because before it wasn't worth very much. Now they're starting to pick up in price, and so we want to get them out the door. But the thing I would say is it, it does, like Ralph said, take a mentor. It takes somebody to really push you out of your comfort zone to look at it, to look at your practice, to really evaluate is it necessary or is it not, and get the facts. Try to figure it out. Reach out to the, to the universities that, uh, that can help you and the trade associations that are actually doing the work on it. Yeah, I, I really like these guys' the answer. Um, the, the one word I would give it is, is uh, community. Uh, you need to have a, a group of of peers or mentors or someone that you can bounce ideas off of they can uh, they can pump you up when you need it and can bounce ideas off of and um, can help you keep moving forward so when we got started uh, we basically kind of did it on our own we were out on the bleeding edge at that point uh, but over time uh, I've found other people who are doing it uh, you know social media has all of its ups and downs but one of the ups for me is is it's cool to see a lot of other guys, uh, other farms that are that are pushing the envelope and picking their brain and getting ideas, and that motivates me to keep trying uh, new things on our farm as well. So um, I think it's really about community and, and having people that, that you can work with. Um, you know, we, we got to remember in agriculture, a big part of that word is culture. And so every farm is different. Every farm has its own culture. You have your strengths, your weaknesses. Uh, your different terrains and so you got to figure out how cover crops fit for you and, and some of these other practices so you know for me I'm trying to reduce erosion for other places uh, you know it, it might be about nutrient cycling or water management or any number of things so uh, figure out your group that you can work with figure out what your goals are and then and then jump into it and and and, and like like they said you got to be persistent we've been on the bleeding edge and and we have bled so um, you know, we have, we've lost 20 or 30 bushel an acre on a field or two on corn trying to push the envelope on things, but you got to be willing to do that uh, to get there. And something I heard from another speaker <clears throat> a few weeks ago is when you try it, you don't need to try it on your entire farm, but try it on enough acres that it's going to hurt a little bit because uh, it's going to motivate you to pay more attention, to observe what's going on in the field, um, and, to, and to figure out how you're going to move forward. So. Don't go whole hog, but but make sure it's going to hurt a little bit so you're motivated to, to keep an eye on it and keep learning from it. Great. Thanks, all of you. And, and thank you. I'm sure many of you are that mentor for a lot of other farmers. So thanks for your, your service with that. Um, and I, I just wanted to make sure that we got to that question because it's a really important one. 
Uh, so now let's shift over to the carbon conversation. I feel like this is the hot topic in agriculture right now. Um, you guys have mentioned increases in soil organic carbon on your farm that you've measured. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about carbon. Um, I know, Mark, you are you are measuring um, your carbon intensity score. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that, and then Will and Ralph, if you have thoughts as well. Let's just dive in and see where see where the conversation goes. See where it goes. All right. Um, yeah, I actually uh, so. About a year ago, I took an off-farm job with a with a company uh, that actually does modeling and and scores um, carbon and carbon intensity specifically to the farm practices, and you know it's it's really it seems like everything has come together um, to for that. And ag is that solution. Um, it is a case where there's there's some struggles and some you know how do you measure it. How do you value it? How, how do you get it so that it's accurate? And, and how can you measure that over time? And then there's two components of it. It's reduction and emissions. And so really, how do you get that and that value going back to the farmer? That's the, really the difficult task that I think many of these carbon programs are having. Um, it's a fact that as we till less, as, as we use less nitrogen, as we use cover crops and create the microbial activity to, to generate and break down that organic matter into carbon, long-term carbon, um, it's good. It's a fact. We're seeing um, more issues with weather, more violent uh, things. And so if ag can be that solution, um, this is a great way for that. So I would encourage anybody to really dig in and understand what is actually happening with with their soils from a carbon perspective and ask those hard questions, soil organic carbon versus sequestered carbon and how deep is it going, all those things. So, um, and there's all kinds of programs out here that allow you, um, for me, if, if I've got um, emissions and if those emissions can be reduced and somebody is willing to reward you for those reduced emissions or that sequestration, um, do it. We've got a lot of ethanol plants out here that that whole, um, the whole process of including agriculture and the producers and helping to reduce these uh, climate issues for, you know, for carbon that's been pulled out of the ground, it's our ability to really do it instead of pulling it out of the ground, do it in a circular fashion. All these little green plants are solar, solar plants out here for us and, and we just need to use them any way we can. I don't know if that answered. And that was a great way to kick it off. Yeah. Ralph, do you have uh, I'm going to throw you a curve. This is, this is an idea I've been kicking over, but, uh, you know, the ethanol plants are real big right now that they want to do this carbon reduction, you know, and get rid of their carbon and send it in the pipeline or put it in the ground, you know, and whatever. But uh, why don't we come up with an idea that uh, as they buy our grain that we get a carbon credit as farmers on what we do to, to reduce the carbon in in the air and uh, you know I don't know how you go about it but if you could get a credit when you go to sell your grain for for the carbon thing it'd be far better than than selling it to some company you know and I don't know who could who could come up with a system like that but it would keep it you know a fair situation it would be uh, a benefit to a farmer to, to anybody selling grain but uh, you know we're the ones doing the work let's get the credit for it you want me to address that all right um, so yeah there is uh, there's modeling out here Ralph and the, the modeling that's here for these farmers um, as a farm today the Greek model and some of these carbon programs California LCFS the low carbon fuel standard it it gives you a default value for those emissions that you're creating. It throws all the farms into a Midwest. If you're a corn eth delivering corn into an ethanol plant, you're getting a score of, of right at 29.6 29 CI points. What does that mean? That means that it's uh, 29.6 grams megajoule per energy produced in the gallon of an ethanol. So no-till, it has a score, and, and GREET has done the modeling. Um, Comet Farm, USDA's done some, 
There's all kinds of models that are out here that actually give that value. So today, um, CARB, which is the California Air Research Board, is actually taking comments on how we can get it so that this is not just about paying the farmer for these credits, but it's about having, how can we change and actually make these carbon reductions so that if I, as a farmer, um, are implementing practices that are less than the, uh, the standard or the, the, the average, then that credit should go to the ethanol plant. Then that ethanol plant can get more value for their ethanol through that. Um, ethanol plants can do that today by putting uh, carbon in the ground, um, CCS. You know, for every, every gallon of crude that comes out of the ground, there's 50% of that is carbon that's been released up in the atmosphere. So all of that in the process, if we can implore better farm practices and get credit for that, that's one way. No-till. Cover crops, um, same thing. How can we keep it? Um, methane avoidance, all those practices are scored through these models. So it's a great question. Um, the science and the technology is allowing that to mature, and we're almost there. Um, EPA is starting to look at it, some of these farm pr practices. So um, it's something that many of these ethanol plants and, and, and companies are focused on. Yeah. So. And I'll just jump in before we hear from Will, but I, I think you guys are doing a great job showing that there's there's a lot of different ways that we can account for carbon and emissions uh, across farms and that farmers can reap the benefits of that not only on their fields but also economically as an alternative income source. So we know we have the more traditional carbon markets where farmers are quantifying and selling credits to um, an, an entity and then there are also these opportunities with ethanol plants and carbon capture and storage and those kinds of things. So I think it's it's still a little bit of the wild, wild west out there. And so that's I think that's one of the reasons that Ben wanted to, to cover this topic, to help uh, farmers out there who are hearing all of these different opportunities and just trying to figure out what's the p best path forward for me. And it's probably going to be different for each farm, depending on your situation and, and your comfort level with different things, especially as some of the rules and guidance for this space are still evolving. Um, so thank you guys for for those thoughts and will do you want to and one follow-up comment as well you mentioned modeling the farms and at 29.6 if you take no-till i modeled my farm muscatine county it's not going to be the same for everybody but if you just do geographical if you start to include yield uh tillage practice the use of nitrogen or a change in form and manure you can get to a negative carbon intensity so that you're actually um, using the soil the way that it needs to work for you and it passes all the way through the supply chain today those models are out there the actual rewards are not um, accepted yet but they certainly have a listening ear and so it's going to take incremental steps to get there so will yeah i can't i can't match uh, mark for know-how on on these markets but <clears throat> a couple of thoughts that come to mind for me is number one um, <clears throat> If you're if you're getting your carbon score right on your farm number one it's helping you agronomically so don't forget that right I, I think that's where most of our focus needs to be right now because that was my exact words I was going to use is it's the wild wild west right now um, so <clears throat> I think focusing on how lowering your carbon score agronomically is just good for your bottom line and good for your crops right and good for your fields and then secondly I think um, I think that it's exciting that there could potentially be another marketplace out there that's going to help diversify our farms economically. I think it's going to make them both environmentally and economically more sustainable. Uh, but I would be a little bit cautious because, like I said, I think there's a lot of middlemen, and um, I, I'm just afraid there's a few of them out there that might set us back a ways. Um, but I think that it's exciting for the future that there's a way to, to maybe be able to diversify some of our income, that it's not going to be so... Uh, up and down driven like a commodity market is so that that would be my words is focus on your farm I think also focus on your inputs because uh, correct me if I'm wrong Mark but I think nitrogen is going to be a huge you know is, is got a huge energy intensity score to it yep. so um, you know think about your inputs from a carbon score standpoint as well and how can you make yourself more sustainable because down the road I think that's going to become a bigger part of it too Great. Thanks. yeah there's 
and in in that there's natural ammonia right or natural manure is a great input there's also green ammonia in some some projects that are happening um, out here blue ammonia where they're actually using renewable energy to to create some of that so consider all those things as you start to to really buy your inputs and and look at the carbon uh, platform so great thanks guys any Ralph, any final comments on that topic? <laughs> no, yeah. I, I'll, I'll quit right there. <laughs> Great. Um, so our, I, our last official topic before we hear some questions from the audience is rented land. So I think when we chatted earlier, each of you rent at least some of your land. So can you talk a little bit about the conservation practices that you use on that rented land and how you're working with your landlords <coughs> to enable those practices? And um, yeah, Ralph, or sorry, Will, why don't you start? <laughs> Getting back at me for that comment, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, my farm uh, is probably a little bit unique. So for a number of years, I was 100% rented ground. Uh, and now I'm still 90% rented ground. For me, I'm, I'm probably a little bit of an idiot. Um, I've just gone ahead and done it, right? Uh, I didn't necessarily ask for the landlords to buy in. I didn't ask for a reduction in rent. I didn't ask them to help pay for the cover crop. Uh, I just started doing it. And then I, I like to take my rent check to each of my landlords and just have open communication. So I'm talking to them multiple times a year. And several of them have bought in over time as they've seen it. Um, I've even had one landlord come to me uh, a new landlord and say, I want you to rent my farm because I see what you're doing on the neighbor's farm. And that was a huge, that was a huge day. <laughs> you know, you take a victory lap after that one. So, um, you know, I've been asked about it before. Um, one of the things that all my landlords have in common is they all live close to the land that I'm renting from them. Um, the reason I point that out is I think they see what's happening on their ground. And, and so they end up caring more about it than, than the distant landlord. So uh, I, honestly, I think it's gonna be a little bit hard, you know, if you have um, uh, landlords that are, are, are distant or separated from their land a little bit, but I think it's doable. The other thing that we've done is I've worked really hard at driving my costs down on how I do my cover crop, okay? If it's costing me 50, 60, $70 an acre to put a cover crop in, when times get tough, that's a lot of money you can save in a hurry, right? But on our operation right now, we've got it down to, uh, on my corn ground, it's only costing me about 12 or $13 for seed and application, fuel, labor, everything. And I can get it done, I can usually cover all the ground we've harvested in about two or three hours each night with a part-time help, okay? So some of it is you, you don't make it too expensive for yourself, don't get too fancy. Keep it simple, keep it cost effective so it's much easier for it to show a return and make it easy for yourself so that it's not such a huge obstacle that when you're in the middle of already trying to climb the harvest mountain, you aren't making another mountain for yourself in the way that you're trying to do your cover crop. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Will touched on it, keeping it simple. Um, we put ours on with a broadcast spreader as soon as we can after the combine and we put um, a, a person in that and and really get it on ASAP. Um, the, the other part, um, yeah. <laughs> Will had a lot of good points there, and uh, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, you got landlords you can work with and they're really interested in maintaining their farms, and, and the, the ones that live a little further away from it don't have quite the interest in it. But uh, the ones that you know, do have interest, you know, you can take them around, especially after heavy rains, show them, show them what needs to be done on their farms, you know, where the erosion problems are and what you can do to help solve those things. And uh, if they're generally interested in their farms, they're going to listen to you. And the more interest you show in them and their farms, the more they're going to work with you. But, uh, you know, keep it simple. You know, don't, you don't have to spend a lot of money at it. Uh, like in our area, they don't have to throw up a bunch of terraces, just do some filter strips, you know, put some buffers up there. Uh, you know, we make hay and stuff because we got cows, but uh, we can do a lot with, with the buffer strips, filter strips around those side hills, headlands and everything. I was gonna make one comment here a while back that uh, I do a lot of headlands and I've got a farm that 
every three years I had to go in there and, and straighten it all up because it washed like hell. Since I put headlands on it, I've never touched it. It's, it's holding, it's staying like it's supposed to be, it's productive. And, uh, you know, sure, I'm not farming it, but the way it was going, pretty soon there wasn't going to be any dirt left on it. The headlands did the job, and, uh, you know, it was a good practice. So when it comes to, to landlords, just rent with them, work with them, and keep it as simple as you can. I lost my train of thought earlier, and I, it's, what I wanted to touch on is when I first approached our landlords, it was really hard. It was a hard discussion because, you know, we're paying them the rent, and then we're asking them also, hey, is there anything that you can help us for that? So we covered it, just like what Will did. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's all kinds of programs out here, and really, as a partner, get with the NRCS office, get with the FSA, uh, state programs, crop insurance. Um, there's a great program out there, five bucks an acre off of your crop insurance for everything that you put cover crop on. What a great deal. Um, huge discounts. There's also some uh, equip and some CSP funding that's out here for grazing and manure. So if you're incorporating that, so there's all kinds of incentives that can help you with that. There's technology grants that if you're looking for a new and innovative way to put that on your equipment that you've either already got or you're looking to incorporate something new, uh, work with those companies to, to really get creative on that. So that's, yep. Uh, yeah, two thoughts to add on to that. I, the, the, the thought I should have closed with, I, I lost my train of thought too, was by, by being willing to go out and make that investment in the landlord's ground, um, I think that that can build a lot of trust and that can show where your intent is with the landlord, right? If you're willing to just do that for a year or two, then they realize, you know, where, where you are in, in it. So, again, by keeping it, you know, simple and cost effective, you can, you can make that sacrifice and it's not going to kill you uh, to, start that, to start that off. Mark made a great point. There's a lot of programs out there. You know, early on, I was like, no, I'm going to do this myself. I, I don't want to have to fill out a lot of paperwork. I don't, I don't want to have to deal with all that stuff. And then I had one of our NRCS um, office people, you know, talk me into to doing one of those programs. And I'm really glad they did because it really helped us move our game a lot faster than we could have otherwise. So we've done an equip program. We've done the, the IDALS uh, crop insurance credit. Um, the uh, Iowa Department of Ag also has uh, another cover crop program. Uh, we're doing programs that ADM and Cargill have uh, where they're helping pay for cover crop. And so because we've got our costs down and everything, uh, we're to the point where between all these different programs that are out there, I, I'm really not paying anything out of pocket for my cover crop, you know, between all these different programs. But why I'm really appreciative of it is rather than making that investment myself, and it might have taken me six, seven, eight years to get to where I'm at, I got there in two or three years because I could invest in the technology and kept pushing the limit of what worked on our farm and where I thought we needed to get to. And we could do that so much faster uh, with some of those other programs than if we had just gone it ourselves. So I, I agree with Mark. That's a great point to make is there's just a lot of different opportunities out there, uh, people wanting to invest in your sustainability goals. So go out there and get it. You'll get there a lot faster. And it's a lot more fun. <laughs> I was going to add to this. With this, these programs, in, in our area, sometimes there's some watershed projects down there where they're working on trying to get scores higher to clean the water in these watershed projects. Uh, I found that, you know, once you start doing these practices, you get into the NRCS and whatever, they can use all the practices you're performing to help with those water scores in those watershed projects. And the way this thing's going right now, we have to really pay attention to our quality of water. And anything you can do to help those watershed projects attain higher scores, cooperate with them all you can. Well, thank you guys. You have done a terrific job. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so uh, I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so if you just want to raise your hand and shout out your question. And then I don't, are, are we taking any questions from online? No? Okay. Any questions out there? Go for it. Mark mentioned technology grants. Is that USDA or state or The question was. Repeat the question. Yeah. 
Yes, she's asking about the source of the technology grants. Was it USDA or, or some other entity? So specifically, I can't tell you the, if it's USDA, NRCS, or FSA, but I was specifically talking with our NS, NRCS officer uh, was out on our farm, and I said, you know, we're considering this. And he said, you may take a look at making a research or technology grant application uh, for that. And so it's one of those things where if you can present it in the right way, work with them, or if you've got an idea, might seem crazy, but it might be something that nobody's thought of. And, and uh, I think the point is, with all of it is, there's all kinds of helping hands out here. If you're sitting on the fence and you really, you're kind of nervous about dipping your toe in the water, work with any of those associations. Um, Practical Farmers of Iowa um, has a great program that, that's working with, um, we actually have a, a cover crop company that we've formed to accelerate that. So Practical Farmers of Iowa is, is creating an accelerator program to really get it so that there's more cover crops that are available, the application process is in place, et cetera. It's a great program that, that really, uh, if you think of it, if all of these corn and bean acres turn to uh, a rye or a clover or some other, there's another crop that's going to develop out of this, and, and we're going to have to get that supply chain, the application, and all of that so that it's done within a two-month window, which is uh, really, it, it'll be a really cool thing, but it's going to take some technology to do that. Yeah, and on that technology note, I know PFI has also recently come out with a, an app called like, the Cover Crop Finder app, I think, or something like that. But it's it tender for cover crops. Yeah, <laughs> it's a tender for cover crops. Yep. Yeah, that's and grazing. Um, They've got the, the, uh, the grazing program as well. Oh, that's right, to sort of match yep. people with grazers. Yep. So that, but that cover crop finder app is a great way to locate seed in your area, but also applicators. So if you're looking to get started and just aren't quite sure where to go, um, check that out. And I'm sure it's on their website, um, cover crop finder, something along those lines. Yep. To, to answer your question specifically, it is a USDA program. I believe it's NRCS, but I think it just got announced here this last fall, if I remember correctly. So if you do a quick search online, it should it should come up um, pretty high in the in the list of things. So, I, but I believe it's under the NRCS. So, other questions. Go ahead. You guys plant corn into the cover crops? Question was: Do you guys plant corn into your cover crops? Yeah, we plant 100% of our corn acres into green cover crop. Yep. We, we, we're using cereal rye right now, so <clears throat> uh, Mark, Mark alluded to it earlier. So um, I think the number one reason it's worked for us is, is the strip till. Um, and actually the way we're doing it now is we're banding our cereal rye in between where our corn rows are going to be for the next year. So we're doing kind of a controlled traffic situation. So we're, we're moving the competition of the corn and the cereal rye away from one another. Um, uh, and we're planting a green. So I think, I think it's the location of the rye and the corn. It's the banding of nutrients. It's timing of nutrients. If my rye gets real big in the spring in my corn fields, then my side dress application I might have done in mid to late June, I might move that up and do it as the corn's coming out of the ground. Uh, because you have to kind of think of the cereal rye as what would you do in a corn on corn situation on your farm. And so a lot of times the nitrogen needs to be moved forward to help pay the penalty early in the season when you don't have a lot of nitrogen available because the cover crop's doing its job. But what will happen then is later in the season that, that rye will break down, and as it breaks down, then you're getting that nitrogen release from the cover crop coming back to your corn. You know, we've had years when it's been dry where I've gone out and looked at corn after brown silk and still had rye that was 18 inches tall, you know, a brown carcass underneath the corn because it had been dry enough it just hadn't broke down, but then we caught some rains in August and September, and by the time you know we got closer to harvest, it had all melted away. So where did those nutrients go? Well, they went back into the profile and were available for the crop during grain fill. So um, if you're going to do that, again, systems approach. You, I've had neighbors where all they did is they just went out and planted into that cereal rye and didn't change anything about their system, and it didn't work, and then I hear at the coffee shop, well, and that just didn't work, we're not gonna do it. No, you have to think about, if you're gonna add cereal rye to your corn, think about your fertility, think about your tillage program, 
think about your timing of when you do everything because it affects everything in your system with your corn. I think that's where a lot of guys trip, trip themselves up. And one more thing that, um, think about the insecticide as well. So when you're going out to burn that down, um, you want to get a kill on um, any, any uh, armyworm. eggs, armyworm, right? So that's a, a major concern, just a, a very low rate, a couple bucks an acre. Um, I'm not an agronomist, I'm not making that recommendation, but work with your agronomist to do that to make sure that you, you know, <laughs> you're concerned with that and, and stay focused on it. So what you wanna do, I think Will touched on it and Ralph has touched on it, you just have to manage it. It takes a little bit more management, but that management goes a long ways if, if you catch it early. Great question. Question was about cover crop mixes and cocktails, if anyone's tried that. You know, I, I think if you're just getting started, try to keep it simple. As you get more involved, there's some great programs out here um, that can add nitrogen, crimson clover, sweet clover, et cetera. But with each one of those comes, again, more management, et cetera. Um, from a grazing standpoint, it depends on what your purpose is, right? So really focus on, Here's my goal. This is the intent that I want to start with, or this is where I want to be in the end. What is it that I want, I'm really trying to do? Ditto on that, but uh, I guess what you want to remember, uh, rye is a grass, and grasses are a little easier to establish. When you go with those legumes, they're harder to get them to grow and everything. So start with a, with a grass and then work your way into it. But that's one reason why rye is so popular, because it's easier to establish that. Questions? Yeah, we've we've uh, we we've tried all the different broadleaf things that we can. So, the the number one fundamental problem we've run into is it's hard to get enough growing season in the fall to get them large enough to be winter hardy and survive the winter. So we've gone all the way down to a two o soybean planted the first of April, came back and harvested the tenth of September, drilled it in on the tenth of September. So we had 30, 35 days for the killing frost, and the problem is I could get that stuff about that big and half of it would survive and half of it wouldn't but after that point it just didn't really grow more so I think if if we're gonna go to other species besides grasses like Ralph was talking about um, I think you either got to go to a, a different crop rotation where you're able to move up the planting of that stuff earlier in the season um, otherwise I think you're gonna kind of have to stick with grasses so I I've, you know I've tried a whole bunch of those different things I'm not saying don't try them but I'm just saying those are the headwinds I've run into with them. The other thing I've thought about doing is trying some cool season legumes early in the spring. You know, could we go out and frost seed something in March, you know, and let it grow into the spring and even let it keep growing as we plant the corn or something and, and see what happens. So that's where the clovers, faba beans, winter peas, you know, some of those cool season legumes. That's something I want to try in the future. I, I, I don't have any firsthand experience, but that we're, that's where my head's at in how can we get, we're, we're either going to have to do something, I think, real early in the spring, or we're going to have to get to a three-year crop rotation where we could plant something like in July and give it time to, to grow. We did follow oats with peas one time and, and a oat pea for a cover crop the next year. Um, nitrogen, we could really cut back on our nitrogen at the end of that, so. Awesome, we probably have time for one more question. If there are any burning questions out there? Bring them on, this is the fun part. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. From about at least the cotton during the season, is that there's less risk of a more resilient operation. What about ag ledgers and finance trades? Is there, is there any word out there, have you talked to lenders that are you getting, is there some better financing coming from some of these ag lenders? The question was about uh, better terms from ag lenders um, in light of the resilience that these cropping practices provide and reducing risk. Short answer, no. I'm not seeing anything from the, the, the lending situation. Um, but what I am saying, you know, to expand a little bit upon that, crop insurance, you know, why reduce that or why encourage it that way? Yield volatility. Our yield volatility has dropped. Um, from it, you know, in the in the times, um, the recent droughts that we've had, or the least last summer, the dry periods. Uh, Ten years ago, we'd have had a ridge 
a couple sand ridges just burn up, dry up. This last year, we were 140 bushel corn. On the other crops, you know, we were 220 plus average, whole farm average. Um, and in some places, it just it blew me away. I've never seen anything like it and probably won't ever see anything since, but um, who knows? Uh, something's happened that's changed in our operation, and I'm giving some of that credit to the, the soil practices we're incorporating and our partners have allowed us to do. Uh, right now, today, uh, there aren't a lot of programs out there, but um, in some of the discussions I've had with companies, there is a lot of interest uh, in providing something. So I'm not sure if it's necessarily going to come from your local bank, but I think it's going to be some of the some of the people in the in the processing network. There's a there's a lot of companies again that are trying to figure out adoption. Um, you know, I I was fortunate enough to sit in a meeting with the CEO and, and management of PepsiCo this last summer and they were asking questions, right? And those were some of the questions they were asking. So there are a lot of companies out there that are trying to figure out how the mechanics of that work. But I, I think in the next two, three years, we're gonna see a lot of companies start offering some type of, of lower interest rate or better incentive terms to help people make that, make that jump. It's coming, yep. And it, I think it's about the relationship side of things. We talked about the landlord side of it. It's it's that relationship and that volatility it's not you your intent is to do more do better it's about food feed and fuel and providing enough of that to go around so that we've got you know good prices good yields stable yields and that helps a relationship with the banker when you're going in and sitting and saying hey these are the things that, the steps that we're taking the landlord supports you and you don't have uh, um, those discussions that, you know, I don't know if I'm farming that farm again next year or something along those lines. So I don't know if that answers. Indirectly, we get some yeah. help. And I would just say, I know the Nature Conservancy has been part of a, a recent report that was looking into this this very question. Um, but to, to Mark's point, I think, you know, even if your lender doesn't necessarily have a program set up for this, it doesn't hurt to talk to them about it and to ask, because if they're hearing that from a number of farmers, maybe that'll prompt you know some questions and that'll eventually move up the chain and, and make something happen. So it's always good to advocate for those kinds of things. It's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we are over time. Um, thank you all for attending today and for your attention. Let's give our panelists a big round of applause. They did a phenomenal job. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope that you learned a lot and took a lot from this conversation. I know that I did. Um, so go out there, talk to your landlord, talk to your lender, um, your fellow farmers, and good luck with all of your endeavors in soil health practices.